final arguments. Chief United States Prosecutor Robert Jackson tells the court why each of the 22 Nazi defendants should be found guilty. On July 26, 1946, the courtroom bristled with energy as the press and the public returned en masse to hear the summations of the prosecutors. Robert Jackson had distinguished himself in his extraordinary opening, but lost ground as a cross-examiner. He returns with a speech that matches his beginning with the great oratory of his closing argument. His use of the English language and the rhetorical techniques of simile, metaphor, analogy, Shakespeare, and history serve as an excellent example to any advocate of those times or these. Jackson invokes the villainy of the despicable defendants, Goering, the gangster, Hess, the zealot, von Ribbentrop, the salesman of deception, Stryker, the venomous vulgarian. Listen to this majesty. Mr. President and members of the tribunal, an advocate can be confronted with few more formidable tasks than to select his closing arguments where there is great disparity between his appropriate time and his available material. In eight months, a short time as state trials go, we have introduced evidence which embraces as vast and varied a panorama of events as has ever been compressed within the framework of a litigation. It is impossible in summation to do more than outline with bold strokes the vital of this trial's mad and melancholy record, which will live as the historical text of the 20th century's shame and depravity. These two score years in this 20th century will be recorded in the Book of Years as one of the most bloody in all annals. Two world wars have left a legacy of dead which number more than all the armies engaged in any war that made ancient or medieval history. No half century ever witnessed slaughter on such a scale. A glance over the dock will show that despite their quarrels among themselves, each defendant played a part which fitted in with every other and all advanced the common plan. It contradicts experience that men of such diverse backgrounds and talents should sh so forward each other's aims by coincidence. The large and varied role of Goering was half militarist and half gangster. He stuck a pudgy finger in every pie. He used his SA muscle men to help bring the gang into power. The zealot Hess, <coughs> before succumbing to wanderlust, was the engineer tending the party machinery, passing orders and propaganda down to the leadership corps, supervising every aspect of party activity, and maintaining the organization as a loyal and ready instrument of power. When apprehensions abroad threatened the success of the Nazi regime for conquest, it was the duplicitous Ribbentrop, the salesman of deception, who was detailed to pour wine on the troubled waters of suspicion by preaching the gospel of limited and peaceful intention. Keitel, the weak and willing tool, delivered the armed forces, the instrument of aggression, over to the party and directed them in executing its felonious design. Kaltenbrunner, the grand inquisitor, took up the bloody mantle of Heydrich to stifle opposition and terrorize compliance and buttress the power of National Socialism on a foundation of guiltless corpses. Stryker, the venomous Bulgarian, manufactured and distributed obscene racial libels, which incited the populace to accept and assist the progressively savage operations of race purification. As Minister of Economics, Funk accelerated the pace of rearmament and as Reich's, president, Reich's bank president, banked for the SS, the gold teeth filling of concentration camp victims, probably the most ghoulish collateral in banking history. 
It was Chartres, the facade of starched respectability, who in the early days provided the window dressing, the bait for the hesitant, and whose wizardry later made it possible for Hitler to finance the colossal rearmament program and to do it secretly. It is against such a background that these defendants now ask this tribunal to say that they are not guilty of planning, executing, or conspiring to commit this long list of crimes and wrongs. They stand before the record of this trial as bloodstained Gloucester stood by the body of his plain king. He begged of the widow, as they beg of you, say I slew them not. And the queen replied, then say they were not slain, but dead they are. If you were to say of these men that they are not guilty, it would be as true to say that there has been no war, that there are no slaves, that there has been no crime. Just doesn't get much better than that extraordinary oratory.